Sorry, I couldn't hear what you said.
Well, welcome back to Cool Conversations. Super. I'm always super excited, but I am deeply excited this week. Uh, I'm just going to set a little preamble, I suppose you could call it. Uh, we've had some tech issues this week at the Barn Theatre, but the staff have gone above and beyond to get this one out. Uh, so it's a big thank you from me to the staff at the Barn. So, how's your week been? Uh, what have you been up to? Uh, hit us up on social media, let us know. We're always super interested to all the crazy stuff you guys get up to during the week. And it's just been another week of lockdowns in Europe and it looks like Switzerland's going in. So it's all, all sorts of stuff going on. So let me know how that's affecting you. And that brings me really nicely to this week's guest, who I believe you can probably see on the screen next to me already, because this is how we're having to do it today, because of the slight tech issues that we've had. Now, this guy uh, I first met in India about 18 months ago, two years ago. I'm going to embarrass him now, but I, I don't really mind. And every now and then, I find that you meet individuals who emanate something out from them, an aura, perhaps you could say, that makes you gravitate towards them. They have knowledge perhaps beyond their years, uh, or perhaps you can call it wisdom. Um, they have a, an energy for life. Then as you get to know them, certain skill sets start appearing. So my, my good friend here, Nathan, I didn't know this at the time, his ability to play the piano and to compose music is off the charts. He's a eminently well-respected wilderness medicine doctor for or an expedition doctor. As I said, he's a composer, he's a photographer, and throughout lockdown, he's been on pretty much the front line of uh, working for the NHS in London. He's a deeply inspiring man, and um, I've got to say it, uh, I have a nickname for him. I'm the only person that uses it, but I have a nickname for him, the Badger, uh, which is actually a term of endearment because the only other person I know that's called the Badger was uh, Bernard uh, Hinal, the, uh, the, the very famous cycle racer. So Nathan, um, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's all been a bit last minute, I realise, but thank you for, for filling in and being with me today. How are you? Um, i slightly overwhelmed at that introduction. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. I'm absolutely flattered. Um, I don't know what sort of aura you, you felt. Maybe it was, I don't know, like a, an ability to get through about 10 chocolate bars a day on that, that expedition or something along those lines. Um, but yeah, no, thank you very much for having me on the, on the show. I'm very excited to be here. Uh, looking forward to the next hour. Well, 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 let's talk about that aura and what it was. So for me, it was, I remember, so just to fill the viewers in, the expedition was with Just Challenge, um, a Hong Kong based uh, company that puts together some pretty epic uh, adventures for individuals but also corporates. And we were working, it was, uh, was it Barclays? Bar Barclays, yeah, Barclays Asia Pacific on their Mind Over Mountains. Yeah, Mind Over Mountains. So it was essentially like a three day, four day trekking mm. retreat in the Indian Himalayas in the foothills near Dao Masala. And, and you were the designated doctor on it. Uh, and I remember there was you, there was, oh, there was um, Jeff, wasn't there? Jeff McDonald. Yeah. Uh, quite, quite an inspiring man. We should get him on the show. Really? But, but I remember clearly one night we were around the campfire at the end of the day when we were by, by the river that night uh, and you were thrown into the tiger's uh, enclosure, so to speak, because we all did like, yeah. fireside chat. I did one, Greg did one, I mean, uh, Jeff rather. Jeff had his totally dialed. And then I think you were talking about nutrition. And I oh, know you weren't, you were talking you about. You were talking about nutrition. I was talking about <laughs> nutrition. <laughs> what, what, were you, what were you talking about? I, I forget now. Uh, yeah, God knows. I was just uh, making it up on the spot. But, but no, that was um, set, set my heart racing, I'm not going to lie, because Lu Lucy, who, um, who owns Just Challenge, sort of said to me earlier in the day, is like, hey, we're doing a fireside chat tonight. Um, you know, do you mind standing up and saying a few things about how to look after your mental health at the workplace? Um, it's a high pressure environment working in Barclays. And she wondered if I might be able to say something. And, you know, <laughs> me being a yes person, I was like, yeah, absolutely, yeah, fine, <laughs> whatever, I'll give it, give it a shot. And then realized it was essentially standing up in front of 50 sort of high end Barclays employees 
speaking after Jeff, who is a motivational speaker, and then you, who are a motivational speaker, <laughs> and then me, who's like, uh... <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, I, that definitely was like being thrown into the lion's den, but it was, it was quite fun. Um, I think I sort of advised people to remember a few basic things like staying hydrated, uh, making sure you take some time out during the day just to, you know, take a deep breath and think about your surroundings, um, listening to music at work. It was just a few basic tips, uh, but it was, yeah, it was a, it was a, it was a fun experience anyway. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and you absolutely crushed it. And, and that's what really inspired me. I remember we sat down afterwards because I think, hmm. um, oh, I can't think of his name, the photographer, because there's a photographer okay. there as well. Uh, what was his name? Nico. Nico, of course, yeah. So yeah, Nico yeah. was doing a, like a little photography course thing afterwards and you were keen to get involved with that. And I, I just remember being so impressed, not only by, I suppose as a doctor, you would call it your bedside manner, you know, a very caring, considered, but one that puts his aura of confidence through, but your boundless energy. And I remember sort of trying to chat to you after your little talk and you had gone across this Nico's photographic little session that he was doing because he wanted to learn more about that. You know, your, your energy is timeless. Uh, and that, that's what really impressed me. And as I say, I, I felt, yeah, gravitated towards you and I wanted to learn more. And then as, as we've got to know one another over the last couple of years, it keeps seeping out. Yeah, but, I mean... It's been such a such an amazing journey getting to know you and everything because you know what like when I first heard that you were on the track uh, you know I was like wow he's one of my absolute inspirations and of course my housemate had just broken his uh, his heel bone um, oh, a few weeks right. before that and um, and you know I'd spent quite a lot of time with him you know really struggling mentally not being able to do anything uh, it was right at the start of his year off after foundation training and he was planning on going doing loads of kite surfing all year and he'd just broken his heel bone and was told you know you may never walk or run again mm. and obviously knowing your journey having broken both of your heel bones <laughs> and then climbing Everest 14 times um it was like the, the perfect opportunity to get to know you a bit and then you very kindly did that uh video for him standing on the top of some nice hill in in India saying you know you can do it you'll get there and um yeah it meant a lot to me that you did that and it meant a lot to jack and he's up and about you know running again kite so oh, he is oh that's fabulous so, yeah yeah he's doing he's doing doing great uh so i'm <laughs> not long after that actually when i got back we went on a, a night out um down in brixton and uh he was very determined and we went we went out and he was on crutches but he after a couple of drinks he thought the best way to get home was actually to do some sort of ministry of funny walks oh. um <laughs> thing home which was uh but he felt very motivated by your your video to him so that was oh, right. well it's good news that he's out running again i, I think and yeah. but, but, but perhaps you can you know shed some light on this certainly uh, I can't knock the NHS at all uh, when I had my accident. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about the NHS in, in a minute, but certainly when I had my accident. But the, the initial prognosis and what I was told was, was relatively, I want to say negative, but they weren't particularly positive about the potential outcome. And it sounded like, um, like your colleague had the same sort of thing. The prognosis, well, you're never going to run again. But now he's out running, he's kite surfing. Is yeah. that a general trait of, a bit unfair this. No, no, it's, it's a good question. Um, I guess you're going to say, you know, is it generally the case that we're quite reserved? When yeah, we're exactly. Yeah. I mean, is, is that a fair assumption of? Yeah, no, no, definitely. It, no, absolutely, because we we live in a world where there is a risk of litigation uh, when it comes to to doctors um, and medical professionals. So while there is a benefit of giving someone hope and being really positive and saying, you know, don't worry, it's going to be fine, you'll be up and running in no time, um, you know, just chin up and crack on for now, and you'll you'll be back to normal before you know it, kind of thing. You know, there, there's a lot of positivity that comes from that you give people hope um there's the benefit of the placebo effect which is yeah, you know that sure. positive encouragement there's a lot to be said for that but then the that opens up the 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 medical professional to risk uh, essentially if things don't go that way then it's kind of fair game for the person to say well the doctor told me i'll be up and running and you know they, they were lying to me they've been misleading me and blah 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 uh, so we're we're taught to be 
much more reserved than I think we once were, you know, 10, 20 years ago, yeah. from what I understand. Um, but at the same time, we, we aren't meant to be too negative either, because that can have damaging consequences, like mentally and even prognostically for people. If you tell someone you're never going to walk again, you know, there's going to be a lot of people who think, well, doctor told me I'm never going to walk again, yeah, so I'm not going to bother trying. Sure. So it's a, it's a difficult balance. And, uh, you know, so we're always told to give things and more more neutrally give things as more of a range so you know saying although there's a chance you might not walk again you know it's there are definitely cases of people who do and do yeah. very well and you know check out Kenson cool he's climbed Everest 14 times you know uh so I think I think it comes down slightly to the individual doctor as well and what their past experiences have been uh but I think there is a there's there's a danger to being too negative about it and I think it's something that we need to actually just bear in mind that there's a difference between falsely reassuring someone and giving false hope and actually just being more positive generally. Mm. Yeah, it's, but it is quite interesting because I, I had various, I had three operations in total on my ankles and the first consultant was, yeah, it's fairly negative. He's like, okay, you're never going to run again. You're not going to walk without a stick. You definitely won't be able to climb. And it did sort of psychologically somewhat crush me. Yeah. Um, but then when I ended up in John Radcliffe with uh, Bob Hanley, um, a, a sort of orthopedic consultant there, mm. he, is, he essentially put it down to me. He, he put the emphasis, emphasis onto me. He said, well, I'm, I'm going to rebuild your, your, your heel bone to the best of my capability so that you should be able to wear a shoe without it being modified. What you do from there is down to your hard work and down to your pers perseverance. So he kind of sidestepped that whole issue by putting the onus onto me. He was going to do his yeah. job, and then what happens after that was, was down to me. And, and certainly from my side of things, that, that was quite empowering. I, I felt that I, to a certain extent, took control of the problem, and it was... It was down to me to make it work or otherwise. So, yeah, I certainly hold... You made it work. Um, I think I made it work. <laughs> yeah, I, I went out and ran 10K this morning before, um, uh, oh, before anyway. breakfast. So, uh, well, yeah. I did with uh, Smash Tea Coffees, so... <laughs> well, yeah, I, I, I got the coffee there. So, are you, are you still... Because I, I noticed a, uh, a post from you the other day, uh, or something you sent through to me, actually, for the, uh, for the graphics. It's all about good coffee. You are quite the coffee <laughs> connoisseur, aren't you? Um, I wouldn't say a connoisseur, um, but I do like a good coffee. I, I don't know, coffee is one of those strange things that you grow up as a child like thinking it's disgusting. Yeah. Um, and then you sort of, I don't know, there seems to be some transition whereby you have it with milk and sugar and then as you get older you start... I, I did exactly like, the same thing. I, I, yeah. I used to have coffee with sugar and now it's, yeah, it's just like, black. I, I don't know, when I was a, when I was a, uh, I don't know, a, a teenager and then progressively as I've got older, I, I think I've started to prefer coffee that I would have initially found more and more disgusting mm. um like like strong black quite acidic um so how do we get on to talking about coffee um but yeah no I, I do like a good coffee <laughs> no, yeah it's, it's it's certainly so so we should just tell the viewers listeners that um you know we got away together last year didn't we so back in the last year we went to Spain rock climbing. yeah Mm. And uh, the, the, the early morning, well, I say early mornings, they weren't that early, but the, the whole coffee thing became quite an important part of the whole trip. <laughs> it's like, right, we can't do anything until we, we get the coffee. Until coffee is. Uh, and then the disaster with the pizza oven thing, which was oh, just, just choking smoke everywhere. Um, but, uh, it was <laughs> yeah, it was like the outside pizza oven that I think after a while we started to wonder if it was actually a pizza oven at all because it, <laughs> yeah, just, it just didn't seem to work, up. did it? We ended um, up having smoked potatoes, I think. So, so, so you've been really. Uh, because uh, I mean, I, I follow you on social media, and I think what you're doing is is fantastic. And and you, perhaps I'm being a little bit overzealous, but you seem to be carving a a path for yourself down expedition medicine. Uh, and I was just curious. I mean, is this something which you had decided upon? At, you know, at the outset, at the outstart of studying medicine, because you, you went to Cambridge, didn't you, to study medicine? Yeah. Uh, not unsurprisingly, you came out with a first, I believe. I did. You did, yeah, <laughs> just another. Um, and then, at what stage did expedition medicine grab you and, and pull you in? Um, so, 
I didn't even know expedition medicine existed uh, until I was in, you know, halfway through my second year as a, a foundation doctor. Um, I didn't really know it was a thing. Uh, so it's certainly not been one of these lifelong dreams of mine. And um, I've always been an outdoors person. I uh, really enjoyed spending time in the outdoors, um, but I'm not from a particularly outdoorsy family. So, you know, it might be dragging my, my family up a hill when we're on holiday somewhere or, you know, the, the annual skiing holidays, but I'd never done a huge amount of outdoors type stuff. So it's all came about fairly recently. Um, it was actually, so, I, you, you know, there's the, the saying about, people who look through windows and people who knock on doors and I've always been much more of a, a, a door knocker so to speak um so not necessarily knowing what the clear path to success is but just willing to try out different things and I think um the reason I came across expedition medicine was essentially because I was uh, in my first year as a doctor I uh, had sort of fairly fixed annual leave and I couldn't find enough time off to essentially get in my annual skiing holiday which, which <laughs> rather upset me um so it got to my second year as a doctor and um <laughs> i had the same situation again and i was like for god's sake i don't want to miss skiing two years in a row uh, so i thought i'd be a bit sneaky and started trying to find essentially medical conferences in ski resorts oh, that's um, a good idea so that I, I like that yeah so that as well as annual leave i could then uh, get a bit of study leave so we get a study allocation where we can use it for conferences and courses and professional development. Uh, and I was on a community drug and alcohol addictions job at the time and spoke to my boss and I said, I found this, this great conference. It's on expedition medicine, whatever that is. Uh, uh, is it okay if I go? I, I would need four days of study leave. And he was like, yeah, same, sounds fine. Uh, <laughs> It was only when I got back from a week in Chamonix. He was like, where, where have you been? You look tanned. I was like, I was on the conference you, you gave me leave for. And he was like, where was it? I was like, it was in Chamonix. <laughs> yeah, so I've had a great time skiing. Uh, so, so I managed to get away to this conference. And if I'm honest, I saw it was on expedition medicine, thought sounds like a cool topic, but I didn't know much about it. Um, but I was mainly going for the skiing. <laughs> and I think the, fir the first afternoon is a monday about two o'clock and we had the the intro lectures and things and that evening there was a, a talk by a doctor called lisa obolensky uh who goes by the nickname of boo and she delivered this talk which was just absolutely mind-blowing and it completely shifted my perspective on what was possible with medicine because uh, up until this point i spent my first few years of being a medical student wanting to become a surgeon and then in my fourth year uh, fourth year out of six years at medical school, I found out about this world of pre-hospital medicine and I did a mini elective with the air ambulance with Magpass Helimedics, oh, wow. and, or known as Magpass Air Ambulance now, and uh, spent a few weeks with them going out in the helicopter to roadside accidents and um, people having heart attacks in their homes and was really inspired by this area. So I shifted focus away from surgery and more into this pre-hospital emergency medicine area. So, so, but, so I'm, I'm sorry, sorry, Nathan, just going to jump in. Right. So, so pre-hospital emergency medicine. So I'm just trying to get my head around that. So you would fly to say a crash scene and then your job would be to try to stabilize the, the patient to then essentially just, I say just, to get them to hospital, to get them through the hospital doors. Your job is to keep them yeah. alive, to get them through the hospital door. Yeah, exactly. So pre-hospital emergency medicine is uh, like an umbrella term. It encompasses lots of different aspects from what you're describing at the moment, which is the helicopter emergency medical services or HEMS. Yeah. So that's like London Air Ambulance, uh, Essex and Hearts Air Ambulance. Um, and it also incorporates anything in the pre-hospital environment really so expedition medicine would come under that category okay um you know field-based humanitarian relief efforts would also come under that category as well so yeah so for the helicopter emergency medical services the hems teams like london's air ambulance for example they are essentially delivering m advanced paramedic care so the team is normally one doctor a pre-hospital emergency medicine doctor and an advanced paramedic or a critical care paramedic and they would go to the most unwell patients or the most complex uh, cases so for example if there's a, a fall from you know a significant height or there's a, a significant car crash for example on the motorway or um in in london it's focused on trauma so stabbings shootings things like that uh, they'll go to the most unwell people and essentially try and deliver 
a higher level of roadside patient care. And uh, part of the advantage of having a doctor is that they, compared to paramedic, is that they have slightly more flexibility in the things they can do and the, yeah. the skill set, uh, whereas paramedics often have to work to their SOPs. And obviously the doctor's working to an SAP as well, but there's a little bit more. Uh, so, so SAP being? Uh, so, sorry, standard operating procedures. Got it, okay. <laughs> sorry, the, the lingo there. Yeah. So uh, yeah, they, they'll do anything from, they do some advanced procedures and the most, I guess, glamorous or disgusting, depending on which way you look at it, is the, the one for penetrating trauma to the, mm. to the chest. So that would be stabbings or shootings where someone actually dies on on the scene on the roadside and the the hems team would literally make one big cut from here to here just open up the chest and essentially wow. sew up the hole in the heart or um you know put their finger on the the descending aorta to stop some bleeding lower down um and it can essentially do open heart surgery at the side of the road and so i came across this field of medicine that i didn't even know existed when i was in my fourth year and saw some of this stuff and my mind was just completely blown um and I thought, wow, that's, that's something I want to do one day. Uh, so bringing that into the context of this expedition medicine stuff, I heard Lucy speaking and she did this job where she spent a couple of days a week in A&E, uh, a couple of days a week as a GP, and then did a couple of shifts a month on the air ambulance doing all this kind of crazy stuff. And wow. then also was an expedition doctor, as well as being a mum of three and going kite surfing on the weekends and running a global health master's and running a global health clinic in Kenya, just doing everything, but like absolutely nailing it. But what, what, what did she do? Did she have like a 32 hour day? <laughs> I, I have incredible. no idea how, how she manages it. Um, but she put up all these pictures from her expeditions that she's done with David Attenborough. And, you know, she was on the planet Earth stuff, the blue pattern. My, I just couldn't believe that this sort of life or world was possible within medicine. And this was a real game changer for me because suddenly like the rest of the week, wasn't so much about skiing, although I was going skiing every day. It was about, you know, I want to find out as much as I can about this expedition medicine stuff, see if it's actually something that I can do as a career uh -huh. um, alongside my main NHS work. And uh, yeah, got back from that and then started firing off countless emails um, until I got my first job, which was on Kilimanjaro uh, a few years ago now. Uh -huh. So yeah. Well, I mean, that's why I fell into it. <laughs> it's completely the, the, so, so, so we, we we've we've talked about this in the past, haven't we? Because yeah, um, you know, I run expeditions, as I think most people probably know. Occasionally, we have had doctors on board. You know, you, you kind of did a, a did a bit of a job for me down in uh, in Ecuador just yeah. after New Year. Um, and it, it is a little bit of a saturated market. There, there, there does seem to be quite a lot of doctors trying to get their foot in the door on this sort of thing. And, and with that comes the issue that a lot of doctors are willing to do it for either reduced pay or no pay. So I'm curious or about, or, well, or paying really, wow, that's, yeah. so a doctor would actually pay to go and be a doctor? Crikey, that's, that's yeah. really wrong. Um, so, so, so how do you envisage carving a legitimate career because as much as it pains me to say there has to be some financial compensation I suppose for doing this thing you are a qualified doctor I mean how does that work I mean how does your friend was it Lucy um, carve is that why she does those multiple things so she get the income from being a GP doing some A&E work and then the expedition doctoring is poorly paid not paid I'm trying to work out how that works yeah, so I think the first thing to say is that you could never be just an expedition doctor mm. uh, without some sort of, you know, main career pathway, I'd say. And that the reason is twofold. One is financial. Uh, so as you, as you said already, a lot of the expedition work is voluntary, expenses only, um, you know, not much of a salary, if any at all. I mean, let's face it, uh, for, for, for someone that's a qualified doctor, that... I mean, I know you're quite vocal about it, and as I say, we mm. have talked at length. I, I, I think that's pretty. I think that's pretty bad of the adventure travel industry to think that they can have a doctor on a trip to look after their clients for free, or even to, a doctor to pay to be there. That, that's a bit normal. Yeah. So there's quite a few companies that, uh, which I won't name now, but there are quite a few companies that expect the, or they they advertise 
working for them as a doctor as some sort of privilege. Uh, and they'll say, you know, if you come and work for us, we'll give you 10% off the cost of the trip. Oh, I mean, that, that's ludicrous, surely. Which is mad, because by the time you factored in your indemnity, your insurance, like, you know, the 90% of the cost of the trip, you know, you're probably paying more than a participant and taking on a massive amount of risk. Uh, you know, you're not in the safety, in the safe environment of being in uh, a place where you've got a paramedic-based system, an ambulance system, and an easy evacuation option nearby advanced hospitals. You don't have any of this safety net. You know, it's you and what's in your backpack and the participants. And sometimes getting someone to a place of safety is is really difficult. Like when I was in uh, the north of Pakistan, um, the evacuation plan was essentially a seven-day donkey ride. You know, if someone was really sick, there, you know, we could call for a helicopter, but that would involve multiple phone calls via satellite phone to insurance companies to yeah. then get on the phone to the British embassy to talk to the Pakistani embassy to then persuade them to send a military helicopter. Yeah, I was going to say, in, in, in that area, because you're so close to China, it, 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 yeah. it is only and, and, military And flight. the Pakistan-India border tension is really you know, high at that point as well. So, you know, even getting a helicopter would be difficult and then to expect it in any sort of reasonable time frame is difficult so you are taking on risks as an exhibition doctor and i think companies that expect doctors to pay it's it's just not right and it means that they will end up getting uh doctors that don't necessarily have the the right skill set or experience going on these things because a lot of people see this as a way of getting their foot in the door with expedition mm. medicine and they are then working for a company that doesn't necessarily have the right uh, standard operating procedures in place, uh, the right support network for the the doctor in place, and there's a real there's a real variety of um, sort of companies that you can work for as an expedition doctor. Yeah. Some whereby there is literally nothing. They're like, great, come along as a doctor, pay ninety percent. You know, the rest is on you. And they don't do much in the way of participant screening. They don't have standard operating procedures. They don't have a standard medical kit. You know, it's all on you. Uh, and that I think is a terrible place to start, uh, unfortunately, which is what a lot of people see as their foot in the door with expedition medicine. Um, and that there are companies that are much, much, much better, uh, where they will have a standard kit. They will support you. They'll have senior medics on board as chief medical officers who will be available on the end of the phone for advice. Um, and then there are sort of bigger organizations such as World Extreme Medicine and Exile Medics who often provide medical cover to larger events. Um, and there was, there was one company in particular that really annoyed me a while ago because I, I noticed they'd taken over providing the medical cover for a certain large event. And on their website, I was just looking through, I was thinking about maybe applying to work for them. And one of their FAQs was instead of how much can you earn as a medic working for us it was how much does it cost to be a medic to work working for us wow. and uh, I, my mind was blown it's like how on earth is that a frequently asked question <laughs> let alone an actual part of working for the company and so they expect you to cover your own expenses as well as contributing to an admin cost and you know so that means they're getting paid from the doctors and from the company it just it just doesn't sit right um but you know, as you said, it's a difficult area because there are, it is a bit of a saturated market. There are lots of doctors who've recently discovered the expedition medicine world and are trying to get their foot in the door mm. and will essentially say yes to, to any opportunity. Mm. And it, it makes. So, 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 what can the sort of the paying client or the participant, the customer, or you know, whatever you want to call these people that go on a trip? So, your trip from Pakistan, um, I was looking at some of the photos the other day actually on your Instagram, fantastic photos. Um, and uh, so, so the, the clients who are on that trip, how, how can the client find out if the company that they intend to go with? has a decent track record or are paying their doctors? I mean, is there any way that the client can find out which companies are reputable and look after, not just their, their doctors, but their, their, their staff? I mean, I work in the adventure travel industry. We're pretty transparent with, with everything, but I'm just trying to work out if there's a way that the client could find out. I, I suppose it's just asking, I don't know. Yeah, I think it'd be through asking. I mean, at the moment, the state of play is that pretty much every one of the usual adventure companies 
that I've worked with, the ones that do sort of charity fundraising tracks, not a single one of them has paid a salary and most of them have covered most, if not all of the expenses. Oh. Um, so it's sort of a fairly level playing field there. But I think what, what is important, oh, uh, are you still there, Kenson? Yep. Yeah. Great. Um, I've lost your video. Um, I think it's, if the client is interested, they could ask the company, you know, what is the track record of the doctor who's coming on? You know, have they been in this type of environment before? Uh, and to be honest, some of it is sometimes that's important. So for example, if you are in going to a remote high altitude place, like in Northern Pakistan, where the risks are much higher, you want to have a doctor who's got experience at altitude and in remote places. Yeah. And that's quite different to say, uh, going on a Sahara desert trek where you have vehicle support the whole way. You're never more than sort of 10 hours away from the nearest hospital, obviously depending on which part of the Sahara desert. Um, and there's no altitude involved. It's, it's, it's an inherently much lower risk expedition. And so I think there are certain expeditions that are good for doctors who are starting out in this world. And there, there are other expeditions that you shouldn't really think about doing until you've built up some, some more experience. Huh. And you've done the whole lot. I mean, for the viewers, listeners, yeah, you should check out. Well, what is your Instagram handle? Because there's some fantastic, uh, I, I say photos, but also stories. You do tell a story around your uh, your expedition and expedition photography. I think you do it really, really well. Just, just remind remind me what your handle uh, is. It's expedition underscore doctor. That's right. Uh, I should have guessed that one, really. Um, <laughs> and, and you do the whole thing. I've seen pictures of you in the desert. I've seen pictures of you in Pakistan. Obviously, we're in India together. You've been to Kilimanjaro. You've done uh, an Everest Base Camp trek. You were meant to be going down to Aconcagua, but I think that might have got binned. Uh, so so you, you are gaining experience across the platform, aren't you? Yeah, exactly. I mean, I see... I, I, I've done eight expeditions now and, <coughs> and I still very much see this as a part of a learning journey. You know, every single expedition throws up new challenges mm. to face. And uh, that, that's why it's so important to continue all the work I do in the emergency department where you see, you know, 10 patients a day who are coming in with all sorts of different complaints. You know, you get that density of exposure to clinical problems that you don't get on, on an expedition. Um, but it's the... You know, d taking on expedition medicine gave me a new purpose to my work in the NHS. It gave me uh, a sense of drive that mm. I didn't previously have. So when I go to work in a &E now, it's like a training ground for developing skills that might come in useful. On oh, wow. Oh, that's quite uh, an interesting take on things. Yeah, it's, uh, it, it, honestly, it completely, completely shifted my focus about going to work. Whereas before it was, you know, I go to work, I go to a and &E, I see the patients and I come home and it pays the bills and it's quite fun. Whereas now it's like, if something comes into a and &E, you know, someone's dislocated their shoulder, I'm like, I'm shotgunning that patient. I am putting that shoulder back in because I want to get as much exposure as I can to putting in dislocated shoulders because that's something that's quite likely to happen. Yeah, I mean, I, I've, I've had two of those in my guiding career and both, both times really? it's, been, it's, been, it's been a helicopter evac. Um, really? Yeah, one skiing. You know, it's very common with, with skiing. It's a pole plant and the, and the shoulder yeah. pops. And, uh, and one climbing up the Gouta Arete to the, uh, to the Gouta hut on Mont Blanc and a client mm. just tripped the base and popped the... And a lot of people say, well, it's actually a relatively quick fix yeah. if you do it in the first couple of minutes. But yeah, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a trained it. doctor. And, yeah. ooh. and one of the clients was like, just do it, just do it. And we're trying to, and it, well, he's screaming. And oh my, yeah. Not yeah, so. it's quite a stressful uh, situation. It's a very painful injury. And it is true, the quicker you do it, um, sort of the, the better in a way. Uh, but there are certain difficulties with doing it in the field uh you know you want to check that actually it is just the dislocation it's not a fracture dislocation mm. uh, and you want to check that the whatever the injury is hasn't impacted on the blood supply or is pressing on the nerves of the hand for example uh so there are certain things you might check if you're doing it in the field but to be honest it was one of the things that inspired me into this pre hospital world as well as, as when I was a uh, fourth or fifth year medical student, I was doing the Tough Mudder race. Um, well, of which, course you were. Is it, is it just another yeah. string to your ever extending well, I was, uh, I was list of things on my, my, uh, my sports team. Who, so we did it as a group. Um, 
and it's like a i think it's a 12 mile sort of obstacle course yeah. uh sort of challenge thing and uh anyway i was about halfway round, and i you know, I was very determined to get over this 10 foot wall and I, you know, didn't let anyone give me a leg up. So I had a very uh, muddy shoe on and sort of slipped and just bashed my shoulder back and dislocated my shoulder um, at the time. And um, it was actually my third attempt at the wall. So uh, it's not a third time lucky. In this case, it's third time very unlucky. <laughs> um, and there was a there was a doctor stationed by that wall who, you know, essentially put my shoulder back in within a couple of minutes of me doing it and mm. and it wow. was really i was like wow that's so so cool like you're a doctor and you're not in hospital you're standing at the side of a, a wall and tough mother race putting shoulders back in uh so that was my first sort of glimpse into the pre-hospital world and yeah he slapped a sling on and i carried on despite his uh, advice <laughs> Well, yeah, it, it, it doesn't surprise, knowing you, it doesn't surprise me at all. <laughs> now, I, I want to talk a little bit about your NHS um, work because, I mean, we, we are still in the middle of a global pandemic um, and it's been a topsy-turvy ride for many of us, yet something which I personally pulled a lot of hope from was a picture that you posted months ago of a sunrise on top of one of the London hospitals on the, on the helipad. And I forget what your caption was, but it was an eye-wateringly sensational, empowering, uplifting photograph that encapsulated hope and determination and, you know, for humanity. Uh, really, really impressed by... Uh, by that and I suppose what I'm trying to get to is what has it been like I, I'm, I'm assuming that working well I'm putting words in your mouth so I apologize but it has been to, to, just, just tell us what it's been like it, it's, it seems like it's been a little bit of, of an expedition with its highs and its lows and its amazing times and desperate times and teamwork and everything else thrown in there that that's the only way i could do it and, and your photograph was wow it's just it yeah was, it's i mean it was fun. a it's yeah it's a big question i uh, don't really know where to start i mean the, the the photo for anyone who um hasn't seen it it's essentially we were it was about 5 30 ish in the morning on a, a night shift in the emergency department and it was just before um, I think it was just before the lockdown was starting to be lifted a little bit. Yeah, it was, it was a wee know, while ago. It must have been about six, seven, eight weeks ago now. Yeah, and and it was there was this slight lull in the cases where there was this initial calm before the storm where all of the elective work, that's the routine non-emergency work, had been cancelled. A lot of the patients had been moved from, uh, you know, high intensity areas to other to other locations to set, essentially like prepare for the the onslaught of, of the covid cases and there was this bizarre sort of calm before the storm where everything went quiet and we weren't seeing many patients and it was all quite tense and we were you know fit testing masks and just checking procedures were in place and then there was obviously the few months where it was just you know continuous um and then that was starting to ease off and we were getting to that point where the, the curve had been flattened, the numbers were dwindling and we had a few night shifts where actually the A&E became really, really quiet by about four in the morning, you know, just a couple of patients coming in with the usual um, ailments. And we, one of the nurses said, hey, you know, it's a really nice night, it's full moon, um, should we go up on the helipad to catch the sunrise? And the, very kindly the security guards let us all go up there and uh, it was a bit chilly and there were a couple of a uh, couple of the nurses and some of the doctors who were all you know standing arm in arm and um just watching the sunrise and i managed to get a, a nice picture of that with the the helipad h just in the foreground and then uh just looking at the sunrise and yeah it was a, it was a really powerful moment for me as well because it sort of felt like we'd come through the worst of it but and there was this dawn of a new age. I think that was what I was I was talking about on the, the caption, mm. although it's somewhat cliched. Um, but I was saying, you know, we, we are living in a different world now and we're, what, six months on from the start of it and we're still seeing 
people going around wearing masks and you know, people working from home mm. you know countless people have lost jobs like thousands of lives have been lost it's a really it's a it's a it's an age that i i, mean, I don't think any of us ever thought we would see and uh i thought that picture was just really yeah as you said it, it just to me had a sense of profoundness and a sense of hope as well uh that you know th this is a new age and it's different but it's one that we will hopefully get through no, yeah, absolutely. And then, again, it is on your Instagram feed. And as I say to all the viewers, listeners, go check it out because it, it certainly uplifted me. Uh, and uh, as I say, I, I found it empowering. I, I, I really did. Now, all the way through COVID, mm. I turned off my, all my news feeds. I was so fed up with uh, what I thought was pretty bad media reporting. And about the only, um, the, the only source of information I had about what was going on was through your social media. Uh, and you seem to, because you're on the front line, um, you seem to have a really good grasp of what was going on. And you presented it to the world through your Instagram feed and uh, other sources, I thought particularly well. And you seem to have a lot of common sense in there. You were quite cautious about things. From the outset, you appear to see the gravitas of the situation. Uh, there was pictures of you out running and you, know, you put a little line going, that's not two metres and, and all these sorts of things. Slightly um, passive aggressive at times, I think. <laughs> what was that? Slightly passive aggressive at times, perhaps. <laughs> well, well, perhaps, but I, I think with a big dollop of, co of, of common sense uh, with it. And of course, you, know, you are a doctor, you are seeing uh, the everyday cases and, um, and, and everything else. And I'm, I'm just curious what the vibe was through lockdown. I mean, you mentioned that the photograph gave a sense of hope, but at the same time, it must have been somewhat frightening, overwhelming, underwhelming. I, I, I don't know. Just can you just describe the vibe within the NHS in London? Yeah, it's it's difficult to paint a picture with one brush really because there were so many different experiences depending on what hospital you were working at what department you were working in whether you were a junior doctor or a consultant or a nurse or a, a, a sister um you know th there were so many different experiences and every individual work within the nhs will have their own story to tell and you know that's even it comes down to you know whether as a as a doctor or a nurse you you live by yourself or you live with other housemates you know whether you've got a family yeah everyone's got their own story um and i think certainly for for some people it it was absolutely horrendous uh i've i was lucky enough to be working in big tertiary uh, so you know highly specialized hospitals which had a lot of staff a lot of senior support and was quite well supported despite being very very busy uh, but I've got colleagues who working at who were working at less uh, big hospitals, some of the more district general hospitals, who were really unsupported. And I, I had dinner catching up with a, a few of them the other day, and he was saying, you know, one night he had to certify 15 deaths, wow. and Jeez. you know that's absolutely eye-watering. You know, that's something you should never have to do as a as a doctor, um, let alone as a human. Um, and I think you know it's going to have a really profound impact on on a lot of a lot of the staff in the NHS. But it's going to be very varied. There are people who have, you know, actually had quite a quiet time because they were preparing, you know, for this onslaught of COVID that didn't really happen in the way that we expected in mm. certain parts of the country. <coughs> uh, and thanks to stopping the elective work and the non-urgent stuff, they had a bit more capacity to deal with it. Whereas in other parts of the country, as, as I mentioned, and other roles in certain hospitals, it was actually horrendous. Uh, so it's a real, it's a real mix. I think initially there was a lot of a lot of mixed opinions, which made things difficult as well. There were people who were quite worried about what could potentially happen, and very serious about putting on PPE in the correct yeah. way. And there were other people who were very blasé about it. And I remember one sort of moment that stuck out to me at work was uh, it was an A and E, and I just spent a decent amount of time putting on all of the rel relevant uh, personal protective equipment, you know, the mask, the goggles, the visor, a set of gloves, a gown, another set of gloves, an apron, all of that. And um, 
saw a patient and then the registrar came up to me and basically gave me a big old hearty slap on the back, you know, right where my apron didn't line up with his dirty club. And I was just like, what? <laughs> like, there is a pandemic going, like, what are you doing? Um, and I, there was a, a big variety in different people's individual approach, I think. So it, it's hard to describe it in one in one sentence, but it's certainly going to have been profound for a lot of people. Yeah, um, cool. Uh, th 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 I'm going to ask you another question in a second. Th just, I think we're having a slight tech issue. I'm just going to ask Ben. Uh, is, is the audio recording? Audio is fine. But, but we, we lost the, the feed there, uh, I think. Yeah, lost, lost me, yeah. But, but, but the audio is fine. That's great. Thanks, Ben. Uh, sorry, Nathan, we're just checking the, uh, the feed there. Uh, you're right. We, we, right. We've lost me, but people don't want to see me. People want to see the I've magic. been looking my own face for the last uh, time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but you're looking good, fella. You're looking good, so um, that's uh, that's what's important. And, and was it a positive? I'm not going to say a positive experience because all experiences. But but was it a? Um, you know, the the community of the NHS. You know, you go in. You know, I know you do night shifts in A and E, and you you do some of the the, the crappy work. What, what was it generally you know, all hands on deck and we're in, in this together and we're going to get through it together and we're going to look after one another um, you know, within the A&E or wherever you're working or was it quite dist yeah. I, I'm just curious what you know, at a time of crisis one or two things happen either we come together and we get through it or we fragment and we, we, we run away scared to the outsider it looked like it was the former yeah, it, there was a definite sense of community within the NHS, but but wider than that as well. I think a lot of our day to day work, we we see just as much horrendous stuff as we would see during during the pandemic, and we deal with death on a daily basis, and we see so much stuff that goes un, unappreciated by the public and. Uh, unappreciated by our patients coming in. They have this expectation that they come to A&E and they're going to be seen quickly and everything's going to be fixed. And sometimes patients can be quite rude and even, you know, verbally abusive to staff and, you know, occasionally even physically abusive. And there's, there's all these difficulties that we do have to deal with on a daily basis that normally, um, you know, go, go unappreciated somewhat. And actually the, the pandemic brought, but everyone together, both within the NHS, you know, we were all there for each other, looking out for each other. Um, we, but also in a wider sense, though, we felt like we were appreciated and we had countless food donations. You know, like I didn't have to take food to work or even buy a meal for, you know, quite a while, which was, which was really nice. And we had the uh, sort of a support hub in the hospital where there were, um, uh, people stations, you know, there was a, a counselor there, some free food donations. Wow. Uh, there was the, there was, there was actually a, a room in the hospital which an airline company had essentially sent some of their staff to to make it like an airport lounge for the NHS staff, which was which was amazing. You know, there, there was so much support, and then the weekly Thursday claps, uh, the all of the signs in London, you know, the bus stop signs saying that the NHS, you know, supporting the NHS, yeah. the, the <coughs> me. tower, at the top of the shard being lit up in blue. There was a lot of public displays of support, and actually, patients when they did come to the A&E were very very grateful, uh, saying, you know, thank you a lot, um, thank you for what we're doing, and. There was this real sense for a while of wow, we're really valued and we're doing a good job and we're we're important and there was this there was this sense of appreciation that we don't normally have mm. and uh, there were quite a few times where people were saying actually I'm kind of shouldn't say this but I'm going to miss COVID once it it dies down yeah and and it's true you know we we've seen it already in the last few weeks COVID's not as significant in terms of its case number as what it was. Uh, we're still getting cases coming through, but we're getting a lot more of the usual patients coming through. Um, all the food donations have stopped. All of the, a lot of the public support stopped. The Thursday claps have stopped, and you know things kind of feel like they were more how they were before the the pandemic. And I think there is almost a sense of you know nostalgia as mm. to that time where we did feel very appreciated. So. Yeah, I think it's it's a good point. I think there there's lots to learn from it, and it, you know, everyone was saying it would be so nice if some of this stuff carried on after the after the pandemic. But there was almost a sense of 
you know, that's that's false hope. It's not going to happen. Well, it's often the case, though. You kind of need almost a crisis to bring people together, to, to, to really see the good side mm. of people. Um, and it's, you know, unfortunate that the NHS, which is, you know, grossly underfunded, perhaps gro grossly... Um, not appreciated by, by by many people. You know, you guys have to bear the brunt of things. And, yeah, I, I, you're absolutely right. It'd be nice to, to be able to continue that. I, I will forever be grateful for the treatment I have I had on the NHS you know, with my ankles and then the physio afterwards and, and, and. It, it was quite remarkable. You know, people like you... Um, I won't say giving up their time, I know it's your job, but going above and beyond to to make people better. It's it's uh, it, it's stunning, yeah. absolutely stunning. Now, I, I've got to talk to you very briefly. You, you mentioned all the food donations. That reminded me, you're actually a pretty damn good cook as well, aren't you? <laughs> I, I wouldn't say I'm a damn good cook. I enjoy cooking. <laughs> well, I think the two go hand in hand. You can't be good at something unless you enjoy it. And uh, I remember a couple of dishes when we were in Spain together, you, you, were, you, were, you were pretty good. Um, I smoke smoke some potatoes i think <laughs> well we, we did that and some you know i think the rice and even even the rice which you cook perfectly you often is oh yeah it's my mother because your, your mother's chinese originally yeah that's right? right you say oh no it, it's, it's my, my you know my mother's influence that's that's the only reason why i can do it you're, you're downplaying everything um all the time and now we're talking about food i completely forgot where i wanted to uh, uh to, to take the next line of questioning that's that's annoying um <coughs> excuse me so you probably don't have any plans right now, do you, for in terms of what's opening up expeditioning wide? Uh, I've got so quite a few of the things I had planned for this year uh, were cancelled or postponed, obviously. So those are being provisionally planned again for next year. Uh, so another uh, just challenge trip to Jordan this time. Oh, Jordan, have you been there before? I love Jordan. I haven't, no, I'm very excited. Oh, it's fab, there's a lot of sand. I mean, yeah, I, 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 I know you're probably down with that. I, I personally, that's, that's one of my nemesis, because sand is, is essentially my kryptonite. Oh, uh, really? No, I hate sand, I, I, I loathe it. There's a lot of sand in Jordan, but it's a- why, why do you not like sand? I don't like it between my toes, in my teeth, in my sandwiches, you know, down, down <laughs> my shorts. And when you come out to the sea and get it on your, ah, oh, can't stand that. Ooh, yeah, don't, yeah. Don't, don't, don't like that at all. Um, but, but Jordan's epic. Yeah, no, I, I, I've seen pictures at uh, Petra, the Wadi Rum Desert. It looks, yeah. looks incredible. I was really looking forward to that uh, this year. So it was a shame that was postponed, but it looks like it's happening again next uh, March, I believe. So that's on the cards. Um, Peru. I was meant to be in Raja Ampat at the moment, actually, on a diving, uh, diving uh, sort of expedition. Uh, but that's been postponed as well. So lots of things up in the air. I think next year will be quite exciting, uh, but things at the moment are are happening again in terms of the planning phase, but obviously yeah. nothing set in stone at the moment. Yeah. Uh, it's a very uh, volatile world out there at the moment. No, yeah, I, I, absolutely. Um, and I, I actually remember what I was I wanted to bring up uh, before. Um, I just finished, I say just finished, I, I finished reading David Knott's book, War Doctor. Oh, yeah, I, um, I actually ordered that uh, a couple of weeks ago. I've got it sat on my shelf. I need yeah. to see that. Absolutely phenomenal book. I mean, I first came across him on a desert island disc, and I think I was driving into London early one morning and essentially was in tears listening to Desert Island Disc. Uh, and then got the book and read the book, and wow. I mean, super, super impactful. And, and one of the things that I wanted to bring up, I suppose, was, you know, I've done numerous first aid courses and uh, to, to a relatively high level, being a mountain guide, you need to be able to look after people. Mm. And we're always taught, you know, air, ABC, airway, breathing, circulation. But he talks about, I think it's, is it, uh, I forget what, there's something that comes before A. So you've got airway, breathing, circulation, but he talks about really serious bleeding that's got yeah. to be stopped. Yeah, so we, we talk about else. C first. That's, that's it. The hemorrhage, yeah. Yeah, um, and just blown away by that. And when you, when you were talking earlier about being first on scene or looking after people at the side of the road, it reminded me of some of his work in... In, in, so if, if viewers don't know, listeners don't know, David Knott um, takes himself out, so he works on the NHS, takes himself out and volunteers for Medicine Sans Frontières uh, and other 
uh, organizations and essentially goes to war zones. Z Syria, Bosnia, he's been in Africa and uses his skill set as a surgeon. And I suppose what I wanted to bring up, uh, Nathan, was what he found was often you would get doctors coming in, having volunteered for these services, and he said, you know, all of the skill sets are, are most welcome, but a lot of them didn't have the necessary skills to work in that environment because they were too specialised. Hmm. And something which I've learned from you is that you do seem to have a very broad church at your fingertips. You are super knowledgeable about all sorts of things. And is that down to your love of expedition medicine that you have to have that broad church because most most junior doctors will be coming through and they start specializing straight away don't they yeah but, you yeah, mean, I, I but you've deliberately of, not done that yeah i so i'm in my uh just started my third year of not specializing essentially so that i can have more flexibility around my career uh work more part-time nhs and to enable me to do the expedition medicine uh it's quite common for doctors to take a year out between completing their foundation training and specialty training uh, and actually that's the time when a lot of people think i'm going to go to australia for a year i'm going to mm -hmm. travel for a year and a lot of doctors will think of that as an opportunity to essentially you know dip their toes in the water of expedition medicine and think of it as a, oh, this is a, a, <coughs> a, a get a free trip up Kilimanjaro, a free trip in the desert or something like that. But they, and they, they go on the expedition with that sort of mentality rather than thinking, I want to be an expedition medic and I want to be a good expedition doctor who's going to do that, you know, as part of my career for the, for the rest of my life. And that's much more the, the approach I have. It's, it's not that I want to dabble with a bit of expedition medicine as, as a temporary hiatus from my main job. It's that I am genuinely passionate about it. I think it's amazing as a, as a thing to do with my, my life and my career. And so it means that I want to do a good job of it. And mm. um, whether that, you know, if I'm going up a mountain, to me, that means I want to know everything I can possibly know about altitude sickness. Or if I'm going to the desert, I want to know all I can know about heat related illness. Um, but also part of it comes from knowing that you can never, you can never know everything. And the internet is a fantastic resource when we're in hospital, because if there's something we, we know a little bit about, but can't remember the details, you know, it's, it's there to look up. But actually, don't necessarily have that resource on expedition. So I've always got my Oxford handbook of expedition wilderness medicine because you need to have that that backup and recognizing the limits of your own um, uh, knowledge and and skills and recognizing when actually something is outside of your comfort zone and you do need to evacuate. Uh, so yeah, it's 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 been a a fun a fun area to get into. I mean, David David, not just while we're on the topic of him and also cooking. Um, a friend of mine from King's uh, recently put together a frontline cookbook. So these oh, are wow, recipes. Cool. Yeah, so it's really cool. She, it's a great little project, but she um, pulled together a bunch of recipes of essentially dishes that people had been cooking mm -hmm. throughout uh, the, the pandemic. And I think there's about 40 recipes from different medics in there. So I've, I've submitted a couple of recipes. David Knott's got one uh, chat from the doctor's kitchen uh, on Instagram. He's got a couple of recipes. I think Lucy Oblensky, the doctor I mentioned earlier, she's got some recipes in there. And all of the proceeds from the sales of that book go to the NHS supporting uh, the, the NHS uh, support charities, charities oh, together. Epic. So, I mean, um, and where, and where do we find this book? Do we just Google yeah, it? And... It's, it's on, if you go on Instagram, just at Frontline Cookbook, you yeah. should be able to find it there. And uh, you can purchase it through through the Instagram, through the, the link in their bio, I think. Uh, oh, but yeah, so it would make a great great little Christmas present or birthday present. To uh, and what were your recipes? Uh, I did <laughs> one that's... You, so, you know those uh, goo puddings that come in those little glass yeah, yeah. ramekins? Yeah. Um, do you know those ones? Yeah, yeah, no, I, I know yeah. exactly what you mean. Yeah, yeah, so I, I, uh, I have a bit of a sweet tooth, so I'd accumulated quite a few of these glass ramekins I didn't know what to do with. So one of the desserts was something very, very, very quick and easy, which is basically just like using one of those glass ramekins, crushing up some digestive biscuits and those Biscoff biscuits as a little, with some butter as a buttery biscuit base. Fun to say that. Uh, a bit of lemon curd, a bit of crushed meringue, and then bang, it's just a dessert that literally takes about two minutes to make, um, which is very, very nice. And the other thing was a sort of Mediterranean-inspired aubergine 
uh, dish with some pine nuts and basil, which is good. I eat mostly, mostly vegetarian food these days. Uh, right, so I, I was going to say, it's, um, I'm, I'm plant-based, as, as I think you probably know. And I know you were experimenting a little bit with some plant-based recipes, certainly yeah. earlier in the year. How is that treating you these days? I mean, it sounds like you're vegetarian yeah. or pretty much. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, I would say I'm... Uh, I guess you would call it like a conscious eater or a reducitarian. Like yeah. it would be lying to say I'm plant-based or vegetarian, but I, the vast majority of the time eat plant-based items. Uh, so I've eaten, uh, I ate meat actually last week on holiday in Greece. And that was the only time I've eaten meat in about five months. So I'd say now I'm eating meat maybe like three or four times a year, just reserved wow. for special occasions. Um, and in my mind, that's a much more manageable way of essentially treating the planet better, uh, improving my environmental impact, uh, reducing animal suffering, and actually stopping myself from seeing meat as a staple part of my diet is something that I can, you know, indulge in every once in a blue moon, you know, if I can really justify it. Uh, and I think that's a much easier way of thinking about things than oh i'm going to never eat meat again mm. which for me i know and for many people would just not sit right you know there's so many people who enjoy eating meat who if you told them to come become a vegan or vegetarian they'd say not in a million years whereas if you said to them okay don't eat meat for three days a week they would say yeah. okay yeah that, that's doable yeah, and me. you know the it's power in numbers you know no one's going to save the world uh you know by trying to get everyone to become a vegan you know that's that kind of approach will come from the, the the companies in charge you know companies like mcdonald's and um you know supermarkets producing plant-based options that are cheaper and just as tasty and more nutritious that the masses will actually enjoy uh whereas something that can drive that change and uh, is much more acceptable to people is actually just reducing the amount of meat they're eating and mm -hmm. being more conscious about what they're eating. No, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that, that's my sort of take on it. Yeah, I mean, it's really interesting. I was listening to a podcast a little while ago. And I, I'm not going to remember his name, but the founder of um, The Impossible Burger, uh, who's essentially a scientist, a food scientist, and he wanted to put his uh, skill set to good use uh, in some way to, to try to help the environment, hence the Impossible Burger. Uh, and he said it's got to be uh, tastier, it's got to cook in the same way, it's got to smell the same, have the same texture, uh, it's got to, you know, and it's a very broad compassing thing, so it's got to be tastier. I mean, what, what, what does that yeah. actually mean? You know, it's something is tastier. But yeah. what was really hitting me, homie, he said, we're not going after, the, the vegan or the vegetarian is not our client base yeah. because we're not going to have a dramatic effect on the environment a positive effect on the environment by getting vegetarians and vegans to eat our plant-based burger we need the meat eaters to substitute some of their their meat for our plant-based burger the impossible burger and when he said that then it was it was almost like a light bulb moment to me um, yeah. And it, it was incredible, absolutely incredible. And we did this, it wasn't a little test. We were camping the other day with some friends and uh, the father, the husband is a, is a farmer, uh, couldn't be more ingrained with, you know, he's a lovely, lovely guy. And we almost had a taste off. We had a Beyond Meat burger and we had a normal burger. And I said, come on, Adam, try the Beyond Meat burger. And he tried it and he said, wow, that's, that's actually tastier than, than the burger yeah. I've got. Yeah, I, I think it's a it's a really important point. It's you know people who are diehard meat eaters, they're not going to stop eating meat you know, purely for the for the planet unless the alternative is just as tasty, if mm. not tastier, um, and more nutritious and cheaper. And I think we've got to a point where actually vegetarian food isn't what people think it is. You know, people often assume vegan vegetarian food is you know, really super healthy and really boring and bland and doesn't taste yeah. of anything. It's like, actually, no, you can, you can eat very unhealthy vegan food. If oh yeah, you of want. course you can. You can yeah. You know, like the, the corn, um, corn chicken nuggets or corn nuggets and yeah. corn cauliflower chicken bites. You, like, I genuinely cannot tell the difference between that and an actual chicken nugget. 
And, you know, it, it's not healthy. It tastes, it tastes great. And there are burgers such as the Beyond Burger you mentioned. Um, I actually did a barbecue for some friends about a year, a year and a half ago uh, where I cooked uh, the Linda McCartney uh, burgers, mm-hmm. which you can get in the frozen section of any supermarket. Yeah. And a couple of friends ate it without actually even, I didn't tell them it wasn't me. And a couple of them didn't even realize they were, you know, sort of at the end I said, oh, you know, that was a, a non, non-meat non burger. And they were, their minds were blown. Yeah. And a couple of them have gone mostly vegetarian on the back end of that as well. And I think, you know, appealing to the masses is where, where it's, where, where the focus needs to be. And uh, yeah, so I think it's an exciting time. I think, you know, fast forward 10 years and actually most people will be, much more vegetarian than they are now. Yeah, I, I hope so. Um, I'm, I'm a bit like you. I've been, I've been plant-based during lockdown, but I am. Uh, I sat next to um, this lovely girl on a, on a plane to Kazakhstan last year, and, we're, and she is plant-based vegan. And we were explaining about our different diets, and she said, "Oh, so you're one of those flexitarians, are you?" Yeah. It said it in a really nice way, but uh, because yeah. I, I do occasionally have meat or fish, but yeah. like you, it's once. In, in a while and it's a treat it becomes a luxury yeah. um, i mean the, the thing that really um hammered it home for me was actually my uh there were, there were two experiences on expedition that just really resonated with me and one of them was a bit bizarre it was when we we're in the sahara desert and it rained in this area where i hadn't rained for a long time and this essentially river o- appeared overnight and we were sat around the campfire and heard this bizarre sound which genuinely sounded like a herd of dinosaurs <laughs> and we, we were like what the hell is that and we uh we one of the participants you know went off and had a look up climbed up a little hill and it looked like a herd of dinosaurs it was essentially a whole flock of or i don't know what the word is a herd of camels that essentially congregated by this river that appeared to drink and it was such a weird thing seeing camels which you normally think of as quite solitary creatures all in the same place now there were loads of them there must have been 50 odd camels wow. all just there by the river drinking and for some reason my mind just essentially thought that's really weird seeing so many camels in such a small space and for some reason my mind just went to why is it okay that we see so many cows in the same place or so many chickens in the same place or so many pigs in the same place you know it's it's not natural no. um it was very odd so that, that was one thing that sat <laughs> bizarrely with me for a while and then the other thing was actually our uh, expedition to, to pakistan so we it was about a three-week trip and we were going to k2 base camp and then over the gondagorala and our food we had a support team with porters and guides and cooks and our food essentially had to be carried with us yeah there's no quick way up and down the mountain and so we had a lot of plant-based food but we also had uh, a little flock of chickens that came with us and a, and a goat that is essentially our travel buddy for the the first few days of the the trek and the the numbers of the chickens slowly slowly dwindled over the course of the trek and uh but each day we had this goat that would trot on past us at some point during the morning and would be there sort of around the camp at night and each day we had some some leftover food you know the participants uh-huh. the, some of the people i was with they were like oh it's fine we'll just feed the goat you know that'll, that'll keep the goat happy kind of thing and then uh then came the fateful day where we ate the goat <laughs> and um the chefs had prepared goat liver and no one really liked it yeah. and it was all left on the plate and one of the participants just chirped was like oh it doesn't matter we'll just feed it to the goat and then there was a sort of moment <laughs> where everyone realized that it was the goat yeah. and we were like oh Oh my God. Um, and it, it, it just, it was very real. So, you know, seeing your dinner walking with you and, you know, becoming a bit of a buddy before it then gets, you know, gets drop. killed. Yeah. And the other thing was that all of the local team, all of the Pakistanis were eating just plant-based food and meat to them was actually a real privilege. And so one of their local customs is that if they successfully cross the Gondagorala, they'll celebrate the safe crossing by essentially eating meat. And so we got to the other side and we met with a local goat farmer and um, there's a little selfie I took with myself and the goat farmer on my Instagram as well. Um, And it was amazing because we essentially bought the the local team a goat and they celebrated with a a feast, but they, they killed it, they prepared it, they cooked it. And they had this occasion where they were all, you know, overjoyed eating this goat stew that they'd made to celebrate the safe crossing. And I was like, that's such a nice way of, eating meat they really respected the animal it was a, a, a genuinely special occasion for them and they they enjoyed it for what it was which was a life that had 
you know, mm-hmm. given, been given yeah. up for, for their enjoyment. And it just really sat with me. And I thought that's how I want to be with me. I want to respect the animal that is giving up its life for me. And I, I don't want to eat it on a daily basis because mm. it's just not necessary and it's environmentally damaging. It's, it's bad for the animals. Um, it's bad for the state of antibiotic resistance in the world. You know, there are, there are so many negatives to eating meat on a daily basis. Whereas if you eat meat once every few months, you can afford to spend a bit more on it, have a better quality, you enjoy it more because it's more of a special occasion. There's so many positives. Yeah, 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 yeah absolutely that. right on every single level there. It's, it's, it, and it's unsustainable, um, yeah. on, as I say, on, on, on many, many levels. Now, we, 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 I always struggle to bring these shows home at the end um uh but but we've got to do it somehow i i I, honestly nathan i can talk to you all day long i love our chats yeah it's great we we, we go off on tangents everywhere uh yeah (laughs) i I really apologize any one of your questions directly so far um uh, yeah i really apologize about the feed Uh, ben came in to check the feed and yeah we've lost the feed but he doesn't want to fiddle about with it so the viewers get to see your lovely face all the way through um so i'm just gonna i'm gonna leave you with one question um and then we'll we'll wrap it up what what is your ambition within medicine? Uh, my ambition within medicine, it's to so that there's certain things that I've decided, you know, I want to carry on with expedition medicine. I want that to be a part of my career from now until the day I stop being a doctor or stop being physically able to go on expeditions. Uh, so that's something that I want to develop and develop well. So, you know, whether that's doing you know, doing more expeditions, you know, trying to inspire other medics to open their eyes. You know, there is a life in medicine outside the hospital walls, um, doing talks and teaching medical students to share some of what I've learned. Um, so that's one aspect of my career that I definitely want to develop. The, the, the second aspect is obviously I need to make some money. So that's, uh, and ideally progress in the sort of traditional sense of moving towards becoming a, a consultant in some way or another. Um, and for me, that, I don't think looks like it will be getting onto a standard training pathway, which is very rigid, very yep. fixed. Uh, it wouldn't allow me the flexibility I need to go on expeditions. So I'm trying to essentially build my own uh, sort of training pathway whereby I, I work doing a lot of locum work in the emergency department, doing standalone for, uh, part-time contracts in other departments, such as in the intensive care um, and essentially building my own career pathway and mm-hmm essentially it's a bit more risky you know i'm knocking on a door not many people do this and you know i don't see a clear path to consultancy there but i know it's possible i know it's been done uh so that's kind of the route i'm going and mm. i do really want to work on the air ambulance at some point so that's kind of the trajectory i'm i'm aiming for i'm making sure i'm getting my skills set up in emergency medicine intensive care and anesthetics which are the skills you need for working on the air ambulance so that's my goal for the next sort of five years is you know really hone those skills get a job on the air ambulance hopefully carry on with the expedition medicine and then i'll reevaluate from there going forwards what i want to do for the next 30 40 years wow well i mean i i, I love your what is it lofty ambition i don't know i think all ambition is good i mean i i know for a fact that you've also got some other stuff going on at the side uh so we you know i don't know if, if you want to mention that but we just perhaps part that for the time being i've also just heard from ben that i think we are recording um right. I, don't, I don't know whether you can see me or not but we'll, we'll wait and see so those people that saw me on the phone earlier i was just pulling benning the the, uh, the tech back in so apologies um for that nathan listen mate it's been an utter delight i can't wait to you, you you should i don't know quite what the social distancing rules are these days i i get flummoxed it'd be lovely to um to have you come out to the, to the countryside i know you've met the family briefly before yeah uh, that'd, be, that'd be a delight and, and what we should have done we should have got a piano because i know you that you uh <laughs> composed some music didn't you? you you did a little song uh for no, the little, nhs little ditty, uh, very early on like right at the start of the covid i did a little uh little song on piano which um which was a bit of fun yeah yeah and, and i gotta say if yeah I, I can't think of anybody if i'm on an expedition and i need a medic uh, if I was ever, God forbid, or the family in a car crash or something like that, honestly, I can't think of anybody I'd prefer to have uh, looking after us. Um, you, Very you, kind. You always bring joy. You always have a good 
take on something, uh, and as I said at the start, I think you are knowledgeable, and I mean this in the nicest way, knowledgeable and wise, you know, way beyond your, uh, your years. And um, I want to say thanks for, uh, for being on the show with me today. Thank you so much for having me. It's been, uh, it's been an absolute pleasure chatting with you as always. And yeah, I'm very flattered and humbled by your kind words. And uh, yeah, I look forward to seeing you soon, hopefully. Yeah, well, we'll, we'll be in touch about that. Um, right, well, hey, um, that's Cool Conversations this week. It's a little bit up and down, I say. We've had lots of tech issues, but the team, you know, have got through it. So a big thanks to me for uh, the team at Barn Theatre. Thanks for Nathan for coming in pretty much lastminute.com. Uh, it really was by the seat of his pants and, uh, and to a certain extent, seat of my pants. Um, next week, I, I'm meant to be away in the Swiss. Alps, uh, but uh, we have to see what happens with that with quarantine. But we are, are hoping that we can bring you cool conversations from the Alps again next week out on location. So keep your eyes open for that one. But for the meantime, I just want to say thank you everybody for tuning in again, listening to the words, wise words of wisdom from uh, Nathan, the expedition doctor. Don't forget you can find him uh, on Instagram at expedition underscore doctor. His, uh, his Instagram feed is something to behold. Have a fantastic week, everybody. Do hit us up. Let us know what's working for you, what's not working for you, ideas, hints, tips, or even ideas for guests that you might want to listen to. But for me, the Barn Theatre, and from Nathan, thank you and goodbye. <laughs>